Okay, and with no further ado, I'm going to introduce Carl Kurtz, who will introduce our speaker today. Carl, take it away. Thanks, Sally. Amanda, or Mandy, Zock is a Mellon AL ACLS public fellow at the National Conference of State Legislatures in Denver. Funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the American Council of Learned Societies places recent PhDs in the humanities in government and nonprofits for two years. The aim is to demonstrate that humanities scholars have much to contribute to the public sector. Mandy's field is English literature, specializing in the works of Shakespeare, and she taught most recently at Colorado State University. Under the Mellon ACLS Fellowship that she was awarded in 2019, Mandy is a policy specialist at NCSL in the area of elections and redistricting. She is responsible for covering and reporting on statewide ballot measures in all 50 states. We're grateful that she is taking the time during her busiest season to present a speed dating overview of the 11 initiatives and referenda that are on our Colorado ballots this year. As always, you can begin posting your questions for Mandy right away using the Zoom chat function. Please restrict your questions to statewide measures, no local ones, and refrain from advocacy on any of the issues. Mandy, welcome to Boulder Rotary Club. Thank you, Carl. I'm really excited to be here and for all of you for having me. Um, I wanted to add a couple extra disclaimers, which is to say that NCSL is a bipartisan organization, so we're not advocating for or against any of the measures that I will talk about. Um, and I have also been called the ballot measures expert after a whopping one year on the job, um, but I am not the policy expert on all of these issues, uh, especially taxes or things like family medical leave. I've learned from my colleagues and I have summaries for you all. Um, so I will do my best, but if you have additional questions that really get into the minutia, I might have to point you to some additional experts. Um, is the PowerPoint ready to be shared? Um, so I will just note that for clarity, and I hope it's clarity, measures in numerical order. Um, I, I'm not going to move through the measures in kind of ballot order. I find that confusing. Um, so I've really grouped them by theme, which I think is more interesting. And in general, I think I'll spend less time on some of the social issues. Um, then the taxes and gambling, since those are the measures that I get the most questions about and that I hear and see the most confusion about in terms of understanding the ballot language and the different consequences. Um, so I also, I just, the slides are pretty simple, uh, but if your attention wanders, you'll know which one I'm talking to when it, uh, talking about when it comes back. So next slide, please. The first measure I'm going to talk about today is Proposition EE, the Cigarette, Tobacco, and Nicotine Products Tax. And this would increase cigarette and tobacco taxes, uh, which currently exist, and then create a new tax on nicotine products. So nicotine products include e-cigarettes and vaping, and those are currently not taxed in Colorado. The taxes would increase incrementally, and if we go to the next slide, you can see those progressive tax increases. Again, one of our policy experts on this issue compiled this, so it's very useful. Uh, the legislature passed this measure earlier this year, uh, but since any tax increase must be approved by voters, it's on your ballots. And if we go to the next slide, you can see where the additional funding would go. I know it's kind of small, but it's primarily dedicated to health and education, with the majority of the funding going to uh, preschool programs. And as I'm sure you recall, uh, free preschool education has been one of Governor Polis's major priorities, so this is a way that it would be funded. So a little bit of context on this, Colorado has one of the highest vaping rates, but a very low taxing rate uh, when it comes to those products, again, at zero. So proponents argue that this uh, tax increase would even out that disparity and then provide education funding that is uh, more necessary than ever, especially due to COVID-19 budget cuts. Of course, opponents to this measure point out that the brunt of the increase will be borne by those who use cigarettes and nicotine products. 
and uh, that it would. You know, they're, they're tough, actually. And oh. that, you know, they feel comfortable until this is done. Oops. And that they would um, disproportionately hurt lower income populations. Um, so let's go on to the next measure, which is Prop 115, a prohibition on late term abortion. So next slide. And this one is also, I think, fairly straightforward. It would prohibit abortion after 22 weeks of pregnancy, or I, I suppose I should say 22 weeks gestational age. Um, so providers who would perform abortions would be subject to a misdemeanor if it were after that time period, but women who sought and received such abortions would not be subject to criminal punishment. Um, context, out of the about 9,000 abortions performed per year in Colorado, only about 200 to 300 fall into this later category. And that data is from the past few years and provided by the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Uh, Colorado also currently does not have any gestational age limits on abortion, though 43 states do, so it is kind of more common to have some sort of limits. Um, and this measure includes an exception to save the life of the mother, but there are no other exceptions, such as those for rape or incest. And next slide. This is the Paid Family and Medical Leave Insurance Program. I don't know about you, but this is the issue that I've seen the most advertisements on. Um, so this is Prop 118, and it would create a state-run Paid Family and Medical Leave Program. So currently, this is not um, a widespread program in other states, only eight other states in DC have such programs and they were all created through legislation. So this would be the first ballot measure and the first time voters ever had a direct hand in possibly creating a family and medical leave program. It would provide up to 12 weeks of paid leave and up to four additional weeks for qualifying complications if there are any in childbirth. Employees on leave would receive up to 90% of their pay and the maximum benefit would be $1,100 per week. And employees are eligible for this program after earning $2,500 in wages. And that's similar to how unemployment insurance works. And then employers with fewer than 10 employees would be able to opt out if they so choose. Uh, the big question with this one is how to fund this program. Um, if passed, employees and employers would have to provide 0.54% of their weekly paychecks to a statewide pool and premiums would begin in January 2023 and the program would become available for employees in January 2024. So opponents say that many of the employees who would be required to pay into the program will never need it and proponents argue that this would help put families first and provide a much needed safety net for workers. All right, we'll go on to the next one, Prop 116, State Income Tax Reduction. And actually, you can go to the next slide too, Fred. I put a little bit more detail here since there were a lot of numbers. Um, so Prop 116 is a citizen initiative to lower the state personal and corporate income tax rates from a flat rate of 4.63% to 4.55%. And this would reduce state income tax revenue by $154 million in fiscal year 2022. The argument in favor of this measure is that the coronavirus has led to a lot of economic hardship and that reducing taxes on people and businesses will give them a financial boost. Um, I'm not, uh, you know, well studied in economics, but there are certain strains of it that think that arguing lower income tax rates are more conducive for economic growth. And the argument against this measure then is that the state cannot afford this revenue loss right now. Uh, the primary goal of a tax system is to raise sufficient revenue to meet desired spending needs and the Colorado Legislative Council's most recent budget forecast, and this is from May, so it may be different, um, estimated that the state would face a $3.3 billion or 25.3% revenue shortfall in fiscal year 2021 due to the economic impact of COVID-19. So there's no revenue replacement for this tax cut and it would probably require more spending cuts on top of what the state has already uh, had to make. And then you can see this in the last bullet point. I just thought this was interesting. Um, and when it comes to how much financial assistance this uh, ballot measure if passed would provide to people, uh, more than half of the total amount of the tax cut will be received by the top 2% of taxpayers. And if your taxable income is 25,000, you'd get a $20 tax cut. If your income is $50,000, you would save $40,000. Uh, 
that's not nothing at all, um, but it may come at a high cost to the state. On to the next one, Proposition 117, a uh, voter approval requirement for creation of certain fee-based enterprises. I don't know about you, but this is one where when I start reading it, my brain starts to go numb. So I've tried to provide a decent amount of detail since, you know, um, I get asked about this one from my friends, colleagues, like, how do, what do you make of it? And it's, it's complex. Um, so Proposition 117 requires voter approval for any new government enterprise whose revenue from fees exceeds 100 million over five years. This is a citizen initiative uh, that made it to the ballot and um, it has to do with TABOR. So I assume most of us are familiar with Colorado's Taxpayer Bill of Rights uh, or TABOR, but it is the nation's most stringent tax and expenditure limitation and it restricts the amount of revenues that can grow each year, and it also includes a requirement that voters must approve any new tax increases. So a workaround for legislators who want to create new programs or services, but don't have the money to do so in the general fund is to implement a fee or a surcharge, which then is technically not a tax under TABOR. So in general, fees are meant to pay for specific costs incurred by specific users, while tax increases provide for a general and the Colorado, Colorado legislature has moved several revenue sources outside of the Tabor cap by designating them as state enterprises, uh, which can fund themselves by charging user fees for services provided. So the state lottery is an example, and so is higher education. So if passed, this measure would expand Tabor's revenue raising restrictions even further. And kind of to put this bluntly, if you are in favor of limited government and want citizens to approve any large fee increase, then you would probably be inclined to vote yes. And if you are not a fan of Tabor, or if you want your elected representatives to have the flexibility to create new services by implementing user fees without having to ask for approval, then you would probably vote no. So I hope I've made that one a little bit more clear. And we'll move on to the other tax measure that's been getting a ton of attention, which is Amendment B. Uh, it's the repeal property tax assessment rates, uh, more commonly known as repealing the Gallagher Amendment. And so this would take the Gallagher Amendment out of the state constitution, and it was a legislatively referred measure, and it passed each chamber with a supermajority. So there's bipartisan interest in this measure, in this measure passing. The Gallagher Amendment, for those who don't know, is a property tax limitation that required residential and non-residential property tax revenues to make up the same portion of total statewide property taxes as when the amendment was first adopted in 1982. So at that time, residential property taxes were 45% of the total share of state property taxes and non-residential property taxes were 55%. And over the last 38 years, the state has obviously grown significantly and home values have risen people like me have moved here. Uh, whenever statewide total residential property values uh, then increase faster than business property values, their assessment rates have been cut so that the 45 to 55 ratio is maintained. So a little bit more about the exciting topic of property taxes. Uh, commercial and non-residential properties in the state are assessed at a fixed rate of 29% of their actual value. So that doesn't change. And while property, residential properties were originally assessed at 21% of actual value, that rate has been adjusted to maintain that original ratio. Um, and now it's only 7.15%. So without a constitutional amendment like this one, the residential property tax assessment rate is expected to continue to drop. So, in general, the Gallagher Amendment has been very effective at reducing tax burdens on residents. Um, you know, homeowners in this state have some of the lowest property tax burdens in the country, and that's largely because of Gallagher. And repealing Gallagher would prevent that burden from being reduced even further. However, voters do still have to approve any tax increases. So if this measure were to pass, it wouldn't automatically lead to higher property taxes. Um, but this measure, if it passed, it would prevent additional inevitable future reductions in the assessment rate. And in the long run, it really could result in attempts to shift the property tax burdens away from businesses and onto residents. So 
For urban areas that have a lot of commercial property, this can be seen as kind of a pro-business tax fairness measure. Um, proponents don't like that small businesses are taxed four times higher than residential property owners. And in, uh, for rural lower income areas that maybe don't have the same kind of commercial property tax base, this can help prevent future reductions in needed revenue and services. Um, so localities tax revenues have been really eroded by the continual reduction of residential property assessment rates. And as I said already, the state and its localities are all in the middle of a fiscal crisis. Um, and Colorado is already towards the bottom of the list when it comes to education funding per pupil and local education budgets are funded primarily by property tax revenues. So if this were to pass, it would give some of those localities more assistance on that front, and it wouldn't force them to ask voters to increase mill levies to kind of make up for impending assessment reductions. Okay, that was a lot. Let's move on to something I think a little bit more simpler. Uh, that phrase didn't work, uh, a little simpler. Amendment 76, citizenship qualifications of electors. So this would change language in the Colorado Constitution so that only US citizens over 18 are eligible to vote in Colorado. And I should point out that similar, if not nearly exact measures are on the ballot in Alabama and Florida. So there's kind of a nationwide trend um, on this topic. So why have this, right? Citizenship is already a requirement to vote in the US. And some argue that this measure would really only make a seemingly minor linguistic change, right? Changing the constitution from every citizen can vote to only a citizen can vote. And the biggest change that this would make is more future oriented. Uh, changing the wording would essentially prevent the state um, from extending voter eligibility to non-citizens at some point in the future if they wanted to. Um, and some also see this as kind of a get out the vote measure, right? using concerns that non-citizens are currently voting to turn people out to the polls. Um, but the measure would actually have some bigger consequences in Colorado, at least, than in Alabama and Florida, because in Colorado, 17-year-olds can vote in the primaries if they will be 18 at the time of the general election. If this measure were to pass, that would no longer be the case, and you would have to be 18 to vote in a primary. So that was a recent change to allow 17-year-olds to vote in primaries, I think, the past couple of years, I don't remember exactly. Um, but if this measure passes, it would kind of redo or undo that provision. On to the national popular vote, Proposition 113. So this is a referendum, um, sometimes known as a people's veto or at NCSL, we sometimes call it the angry voter option. It's when voters so dislike a law that the legislature has passed that they try to repeal it. Um, so in 2019, the legislature passed a bill to join the national popular vote interstate compact, and that would award all of Colorado's electoral votes to the winner of the popular vote uh, it, for just the presidential election. And the National Popular Vote Compact is then an agreement among any participating state that wants to ensure that the winner of the popular vote wins the Electoral College. So the compact has to become binding, which means that the number of electoral votes from the participating states must equal 270 or more. And even including Colorado, it's not there yet. Uh, there's 196 with Colorado. So there would be no impact for the 2020 election. A yes vote would approve the legislature's bill and allow Colorado to join the compact, uh, as the legislature has already indicated it wants to do. Those that support the compact argue that it is more democratic than the Electoral College and it, that it would ensure that every vote would count. Um, another kind of argument in favor of this measure is that it would encourage campaigns to engage in all states, not just battleground states. And then a no vote would repeal the compact. So those who oppose this measure argue that it would lead to campaigns being more fo focused in large urban areas with more people, uh, and that would be to the detriment of rural areas. Um, opponents also argue that the Electoral College is the way it should be and needs to not be circumvented. Um, so those are kind of some of the pros and cons there. And let's move on to Amendment 77, the next one, double check there. 
So this is local voter, local voter approval of gaming limits in Blackhawk, Central City, and Cripple Creek. So this, even though I've categorized it as gambling, it's a question of local control as much as gambling, really. It would repeal constitutional betting limits and restrictions on the types of games that are allowed to be played in casinos, and it would leave it to the voters in the small mountain towns of Blackhawk, Central City, and Cripple Creek to approve new casino games and new bet limits. Uh, so those three towns, uh, they host most of Colorado's commercial gambling opportunities and they have all of its casinos. And so right now, casinos can only offer slots, blackjack, poker, craps, and roulette, and any individual wager is capped at $100. So of course, gambling expansion would boost casino revenues, at least in the short term, and the industry has been struggling due to the pandemic. Uh, the gaming interests in Colorado are unsurprisingly some of the biggest backers of this measure. Um, a little more context is that Colorado dedicates 78% of the gaming tax revenue to community colleges and the rest goes to those local uh, towns. Uh, so this could shore up money for higher education as well as those three small mountain towns. Uh, the proponents of this measure are also really playing up that local autonomy argument that the people who live in these towns should be able to decide what is best for their communities and that gambling limits should be up to them. Uh, but the flip side is really that uh, the state would be ceding quite a bit of gambling regulatory authority to these three small localities. Um, so casino gambling in these three towns was approved by a statewide vote on another citizen initiative in the early 90s, and they're the only towns that can have it. So people from all over the state go to these towns to gamble and the bet limits that are in place affect them too. Um, and when Colorado voters legalized online sports betting last year, um, the internet operators have had to contract with the brick and mortar casinos in Blackhawk Central City and Cripple Creek. So sports betting limits for the entire state are actually set by these towns. Um, and it's possible that they won't implement any limits. And that leads some critics to say that the potential for gambling addiction might become a bigger issue under those circumstances. And that problem would not be something dealt with only by those three towns. It's something that could be felt statewide. Um, my last note on this measure is really that it would not create any additional funding for dealing with gambling addiction. And that is very common with any gambling expansion measure uh, that we see in other states. Next one, Amendment C, please. So I've seen this called a couple different things. Um, I think the official name is Bingo Raffles Allow Paid Help and Repeal Five-Year Minimum, but sometimes it's the Charitable Bingo and Raffles Amendment. Um, and this got on the ballot via a legislatively approved resolution and it passed almost unanimously. So I know a lot of people were scratching their heads when they saw this one, wondering like, why do I have to vote on this? I don't care. Um, but it's because it's in the state constitution. And so constitutional changes um, across the country in every state except for Delaware have to go to the voters. So this one is actually pretty straightforward. Um, if it gets approved, it would amend the existing constitutional limitation on charitable gaming. It would reduce the number of years a nonprofit organization is required to operate um, before it can apply for a bingo raffle license. So that's currently five and it would reduce it down to three. And it would also repeal the bingo raffle workers um, requirement that they have to be unpaid volunteers. And this measure would allow them to receive compensation up to the minimum wage. So nonprofits can raise a lot of money on raffles or bingo. And so this really could improve their fundraising capabilities. Um, furthermore, the initial restrictions on nonprofit raffles were adopted many decades ago when public opinion on the ethics of gambling was decidedly more negative than I think it is now. In fact, casino gambling wasn't even legal when they were implemented. So there's definitely been a shift in public opinion. Uh, the opposition to this measure argues that removing the requirement for volunteer workers could maybe lead to you know, bingo and raffle games becoming similar to for-profit gambling and possibly undermine their charitable purpose. Um, it's hard to say if that would actually be the case since they cannot be paid more than minimum wage. Um, 
And then the fiscal impact statement says that this measure would increase state revenue by about $5,000 per year as a result of the additional kind of application and renewal fees. So that's not a huge amount of money, um, but again, you know, I think the state government is interested in anything it can get uh, these days. And the last measure I will touch on is the restoration of gray wolves, Prop 114. I often say this one for last. And um, even when I talk to reporters outside of Colorado, this is an interesting one I like to bring it up because it would be the first ballot measure ever to uh, work to restore an endangered species. And so that's kind of an interesting little fact. Um, it seeks to reintroduce gray wolves, restore gray wolves, as the title says, and it would direct the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission to reintroduce gray wolves in parts of Western Colorado by the end of 2023. So the commission would be responsible for developing a plan and distributing state funds to help farmers and ranchers prevent conflict between the gray wolves and livestock. And it would also authorize the commission to pay fair compensation for any livestock losses that do occur um, in response to the wolves. So gray wolves, as I'm sure we all know, were nearly hunted and trapped to extinction. And in the 1990s, the federal government released gray wolves in Yellowstone and parts of Idaho in an attempt to start to restore the species. Those original packs have multiplied and grown and the national gray wolf population is about, about um, 6,000. So the number of wolves that would be reintroduced in Colorado is 40. So it's not thousands and thousands of wolves, it's 40, a small pack. Um, actually, I don't know if that's the size of a pack or if it would be multiple packs. Um, but the number is 40. And this measure, of course, raises the age-old tension between ranchers and conservationists, with ranchers concerned about potential livestock losses, uh, as well as uh, concerns over the, the fact that the decision would be made by voters and not the federal government and maybe not be sufficiently deliberative uh, in terms of the implementation. And then conservationists argue that this measure would restore balance to the ecosystem, uh, help manage big game populations, and serve as a connective link between wolf populations in the Northern Rockies with those in the South. So they're kind of established populations to the North of Colorado and the South of Colorado. And if this measure were passed, the hope is that the new wolves would help connect those. So I think I have touched on all of these rather quickly um, and I don't know if I used the 22 minutes I, I said I would or if I've gone over, but I will stop now and take any questions that you might have. I see some popping up. I can just start responding or maybe someone will moderate. What do you all prefer? <laughs> Carl is going to moderate for you, so he'll Great. bring up the questions. Oh, Carl, I think you're muted. Thank you. Uh, so I'll jump in here and... Uh, uh, we've got quite a number of questions uh, piled up. I'm uh, th th that's quite a tour de force to cover that range of issues uh, uh, so succinctly, and so thank you for that. I, I do have a maybe it's a semi facetious question. I'm interested in you as a Shakespeare scholar. What do you think Shakespeare would make of, of uh, all of these ballot issues? Oh, that's a great question. I um. I don't know that he would have much to say about American democracy, um, but I always, the way I have connected Shakespeare, and he doesn't come up in elections a lot, is that he has a play called Measure for Measure, and I keep threatening that the next article I write about ballot measures is going to be titled Measure for Measure, even though that has nothing to do with elections, but everything to do with power. So it's a great play if you haven't read it. Um, highly recommend it. Won't give much insight on how to vote though. Thanks for that. And um, maybe could you, you, you talked a little bit about uh, one matter that had been referred from the legislature. Can you just talk about the differences between initiatives and referenda and how, how do these things get on the ballot? Yes, thank you. And I honestly, I probably should have started with this. So I apologize for that. So there are kind of two main ways that measures get on the ballot. First, it's referred to the ballot by the legislature um, and that is a requirement if it's a constitutional change or it's something that they can choose to do if it's a statutory change so not in the constitution but just relates to a law and then the other way is a citizen initiative so that's when 
um, you or me or anyone has an issue that we care about, we go through the process, start gathering signatures, get enough signatures to get it on the ballot, and then voters can vote on it. And so the Gray Wolves is a citizen initiative, the abortion uh, restrictions, also a citizen initiative. Um, so those came from people passionate about a particular issue who were able to gather enough support to get it on the ballot. Enough support to get it on the ballot doesn't always, of course, translate into enough support to get it approved. Um, but it will be interesting to see how voters kind of weigh in on all of these traditionally, or I should say historically, citizen initiatives pass at a lower rate than legislatively referred measures. Um, I did mention the third way that things get on the ballot, which is the people's veto or referendum. And that's how the national popular vote is on the ballot. So again, that's the angry voter option. It's when the legislature passes something and people quickly respond and say, I don't like it, gather a set number of signatures uh, in a shorter amount of time than it takes to do a citizen initiative to prompt kind of a repeal of that measure. And so there are only four uh, referenda being voted on across the country right now, but there are many more citizen initiatives. So referenda are kind of harder to get on the ballot because you have to do so very quickly. Uh, but citizen initiatives tend to be pretty popular, especially in Colorado. Okay, thanks. Let's uh, go to Bill Pierno, who has a question about the prohibition of abortions after 22 weeks. Bill, if you can unmute yourself. So if not, I'll, I'll ask his question for, you, for him. Uh, he wants to know how the state will know if an abortion was or was not performed within 22 weeks? That's a good question. My hypothesis is that because abortions have to be kind of reported, but are also historically underreported, that it would be up to the physician or clinic to kind of do that reporting. Although, honestly, I don't know if that's even addressed in the bill, if it's one of those things that has to kind of be worked out if the measure were to pass. And this honestly reminds me of the main criticism that a lot of lawmakers have with citizen initiatives, at least, is that they often circumvent the kind of traditional deliberative process of the legislature and may not account for everything that needs to be taken into consideration. I don't know if that's the case with the abortion measure. Um, I just bring it up now, but I don't know the answer to that. Uh, then we have uh, two questions dealing with the paid family leave. Uh, we'll start with Sally and then uh, uh, TK, when that question is answered, please be ready to uh, jump on mute and jump in. So, Sally? Thank you, Amanda. So do you know on Prop uh, 118, which the family leave, um, do, is there any family leave for people who are adopting in, in that measure? Yes, it does include um, provisions for people adopting a child, yes. Very nice to know, thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. I hadn't thought to include that, but it's um, certainly relevant. Okay, T TK, you're up. Okay, Mandy, my question have a kind of a two-part question. The first part is if you have a multi-state employer who's got a lot of employees in Colorado, how does this impact the employees who are out of Colorado? That is a good question. I do not know the answer to that. That is a great question though. Um, I could take it up if you want to know the answer with my colleague, Suzanne, who is kind of the expert on paid family and medical leave. And the second part of the question has to do with contractors. Many employers have contractors as well as full-time employees. Are contractors, would contractors be covered? That is a good question also that I do not know the answer to. Um, but I will, I will get that information to you. I will take these questions to Suzanne. They're, they're good questions. Thank you. If you can supply me with those answers, I can pass them on, uh, Mandy. Yes, and let me just write down those questions. But I could take the next question too. Okay, uh, let's go to uh, Susan Connolly. 
Regarding Amendment 77, uh, the local um, voter approval of gaming limits in the three towns, and it allows the revenue to be used for community college students. Do you know, does uh, gaming revenue also still benefit the state historic fund and historic preservation projects throughout the state? That I don't know. Um, I've only seen this measure talked about in terms of the community colleges and then the additional revenue would go to those localities, um, you know, hosting the kind of casino and gaming organization. So I haven't seen anything about it. It's possible it's so small, it's not coming up that the, the amount that goes is so small, but I don't know more. And I, I've looked at that one a little more thoroughly and haven't seen anything about it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks. Let's go to uh, Lena Kotke. Thanks, Carl and Mandy. Um, Mandy, you mentioned that Amendment 76 will preclude non-citizens from voting in any state election. And I believe that it also would mean that local communities could not allow non-citizens to vote um, on, on any issue that they might want to give that right to. Do you know if that's the case? Yes, that, that's correct. Um, so it would prevent uh, municipalities that do that, which I don't know offhand which ones do, um, or if there's even many, but it would prevent that from being an option um, in the future for municipalities that have wanted to do it. Thank you. Okay, uh, Bill. Uh, Bill Anderson has a question relating to the process. Hi, Mandy. Just a quick question on the uh, ballot initiatives that are uh, come from citizens. How many signatures are required uh, to get uh, something onto the ballot? So that's a great question. Um, in Colorado, it's five percent of the votes cast for the Secretary of State in the last election. So it's a number that changes every every year, um, but it's always a percentage of a previous election or a previous race. Huh. So we would have to look, so we'd have to look at the number of votes cast for Jenna Griswold and then look at what five percent of that number is, and that's how it's determined. Yes, yes, and that's actually really common. That's kind of how it works. Um, in most states that have the citizen initiative process, it's some percentage of a previous elections race or like the votes cast in a previous race. Um, and the, the Colorado like Secretary of State's office always puts out that number and tells initiatives, uh, initiative sponsors, this is how many you need. But I don't know the exact number they needed this year offhand. Okay, Bill, since you uh, have, have the floor already, would you go ahead and uh, respond to Mandy on behalf of the club? Sure. Uh, Mandy, for 35 years, uh, Rotary International has been working to rid the world of polio. Um, as a result of those efforts, uh, Rotary and its partners have uh, provided vaccines to two and a half billion people in 122 countries. As a small token of our appreciation for coming to speak with our club today, we'll be donating 100 doses of the polio vaccine in your name. Thank you oh, so much. wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Thank you so much, Mandy. We really appreciate you being here with us today. And it's a wonderful speaker and you're so knowledgeable about all of this. So thank you so very much. So thank you, Carl, for moderating and thank you, Phil, for responding.